And happy Easter to you all. My name is John Landis. I get the privilege to serve here in the Roanoke Valley Church, and we're glad that you're here with us this morning at the Y. And uh, he is risen. Oh, all right, all right. I understand I'm not Kiwi. I get it, I get it, I get it. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. It's okay. I'm not as cute as Kiwi. That's not an argument for sure, right? I don't know. Well, my parents are here, and they think otherwise. So uh, anyway, that's all my in-laws are here too. So uh, Lindsay's folks. Amen. We are uh, excited to be able to celebrate Easter, our risen Lord, together. And if you have a Bible, flip over to John chapter 20. We're going to be looking at a few passages today, but we're going to start in John chapter 20. Ever need a breakthrough? Ever need a change that lasts? Ever butted up your head, your head against something and you just can't figure it out? You need to call a friend, phone a friend. You know, who wants to be a millionaire? But who wants to be patient? Would be a great game. Who wants to be changed? Who wants to be loving? Who wants a breakthrough? I'm sure if a friend out there could provide that breakthrough, we'd call him or call her. In John chapter 20, we're going to look at uh, Mary Magdalene at the tomb after Jesus has been killed and recognize that we're a lot like her. And we need to be we need to be exposed as Jesus exposed her and uplifted and inspired like he did for her so that we can have breakthrough in our lives as well. John chapter 20 says there in verse 1, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple to whom the one Jesus loved and said to him, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothes lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must raise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood outside weeping, and she went back, and she went, and she went to stoop to look into the tomb. There she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you had carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he has said these things to her. We'll stop there. Now that's the gospel of John there and the resurrection account with Mary. But if you were to go to the gospel account of Mark, you would see that Mary, after Jesus has died, she did all that she knew she could do, which was to prepare Jesus' body for burial. Jesus had at this point told his disciples, along with Mary and, and Martha and all the other the women that had followed Jesus' ministry, that he will be killed and he'll raise on the third day. But when he was killed, all they could focus on was the next thing, the next thing to do to bury Jesus. And Mary falls, in a sense, victim to the here and now, victim to the present, victim to the circumstance. And even though she does what's right, she misses the fact that Jesus was going to resurrect. And she needed this reminder that there's more to life than the here and now. There's more to life than the current situation, the current circumstance, the current disappointment, discouragement, disillusionment. And she's not alone. We're not picking on Mary. We know, we know Peter himself went back to doing what he did best, fishing, fishing. They had spent three years with Jesus looking forward to him being the Messiah, and then boom, he's gone. And collectively, they say, well, he wasn't who he thought he was. 
let's just go back. Mary does the next thing. The disciples in Luke chapter 24 are walking away from Jerusalem, discouraged, disillusioned. And Peter says, you know what? I just got to get my rod and reel. It was more of a net, but anyway, for you, a rod and reel. And let's just go back to what I know how to do best. You know, the truth is Easter reminds us that there's more to life than what's been going on. There's more to life than the pandemic. There's more to life than the troubles and disappointments of this world. There's more. And more provides hope. More provides excitement that there's more to life than this. Have you ever asked yourself that question? Has, is there more to life than this? Is there more to the grind of getting up for something and then possibly having it be fulfilled and then it kind of fades away? It's fading glory. Or you get up for something and it disappoints you. It's kind of like being an Eagles fan every year. You get up for something and it disappoints you. My family's here from Philadelphia. We eat and breathe disappointment. We are called Negadelphians. It's a protective boundary so that we don't get too excited because the letdown will be much greater. Some of you have adopted that philosophy, Rolando and some others who aren't from Philadelphia, but thought they'd just jump in, join the fun. But that's a lot of our lives, if we're honest. We're up for a moment and then it fades. Or we're down for a while and we wish it would. And Easter provides a moment in time that stops everything and puts life into perspective and gives us an opportunity to have a breakthrough to realize there's something so much more. Our culture, our minds, and who we are, we naturally look to the natural realm of things. Even if you, as you read your Bible, stories like Jesus' temptation in Mark chapter 4, we fixate on Jesus at the temple. We fixate on the bread, but we miss the angelic presence there to support Jesus. There's so many, so many moments in the book of Acts that are angels are, are accompanying the disciples. The angels are at the door. We kind of skim right over it because as a people, we focus right here on this realm. And honestly, if we're honest with ourselves, if you know someone that's like angels and demons in the spiritual realm, you kind of look at them a little funky. Like, all right, calm down, man. But that's our Western mindset that we just bathe in every day. And Easter reminds us that there's more to look at than whatever you got going on. And I love that Jesus, as he sees Mary weeping, doesn't say, why are you weeping? And scolds her for being in the moment, but recognizes where she is, but then reminds her of what he said and who he is. So circumstances, disillusionment, disappointment, 2020, 2021, continued, 2020 wearing a mask. It's the same thing, same heartaches, same difficulties, same injustices, same death going on all around us. And Jesus doesn't say, get over it, time for a breakthrough. He says, I see where you are, but there's more. There's more to this. And that's the breakthrough we all need. The disciples walking away at disillusioned. Jesus shows up in Luke 24 and their hearts, their hearts are burning again as he speaks the word to them. Mary, who's here weeping, then is now leaping and runs off to the disciples to say that she has seen the Lord. These are the kind of breakthroughs that Easter reminds us can happen. From tumult to joy beyond reason. From discouragement to now joy and hope that things can be different. We often ask ourselves, man, if I could just have a breakthrough, if I could just have something intervene to break me out of the frustration, the discouragement, the finger pointing, the cynicism, if we could just have something break through our world that resets our hearts and minds to refresh your spirit, to help you see beyond your circumstances, for you to have something show up that could really, truly strengthen you, fortify you, refresh you, and rejuvenate you. Would you take it? If someone offered you that type of fulfillment, would you pursue it? I'm learning more and more every day the pain of the world around us. More and more the plight of many of my friends and my brothers and sisters, they experience to a degree that I'll never fully understand. 
And it's so easy to let that discouragement be all I see. And it's important, as Jesus saw her discouragement, to see that, to connect to it, to know that this world is hurting and it's painful, and it's a painful existence that people live in anxiety all the time. That the majority of our world is hindered from looking beyond what's right in front of them to no fault of their own. That the collective necks of the world are hunched over, prevented to look up and see that there's something greater. The list of things we can trust is getting smaller by the day. The things that we can rely on are being undercut by the day. Our desire for normalcy rather increases. Can we just get back to normalcy? And this is a little bit of a slice of that. And opening day on Thursday was really a slice of back to normal for me. Go Phillies. But when we face discouragement, some of us hunker down more into hobbies, work, and like Mary Magdalene, what she did in Mark 16 is the first thing she did was let me just go get some spices. The thing I know how to do and what's right, the next thing that I should do, but she misses the big picture. And for me, and I believe for you, discouragement, difficulty, the unknown, we all gather to our sense of desire for normalcy. What can we get our hands on that we can control? What can I figure out? And we just entrench ourselves in the here and now. And a lot of 2021 forces us to fixate six feet in front of us. You got that right, six feet, okay. Or three feet, whatever side you, you lean to. But anyway, if we could just have something that could open our eyes, heal your heart, perfect your purpose, eradicate any spiritual entropy, lift our lives, congeal our community, and forge our way forward. What if something was out there that could do that? Not just promise it for four years, but actually do it. What if that was there, available to you? There's loss in Mary's eyes. There's doubts in the disciples' hearts. In John chapter 20, 21, these two chapters, Jesus shows up in person. They've locked the door. They're hiding. And he shows up and he says, you got anything to eat? And even, even after all of that, they still doubt. They're still confused. There's still a need for hope. And what was needed all the way back there 2,000 plus years ago is still something we need today. We need Jesus to show up, show us that he, is, he can cut through any boundary, like a locked door was the best they had back then. And Jesus walks right through it and says, your boundaries, your natural settings aren't enough to keep me back, aren't enough to keep me from showing up. And he does this beautiful thing of, of the resurrection embodied is that he's a brand new creation, but yet he shows his wounds. He says, I'm not a ghost. Touch me. Here's the breakthrough. I'm back. And they doubted and they feared. But it's a reminder that when Jesus showed up there in John chapter 20 and 21, it was that breakthrough that they all desired. When he shows up with Mary, she changes. When he shows up with the disciples, they change. When he shows up with the disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, they change. Hearts start to burn, minds start to open, joy gets restored. That's what Easter does for you and I. Amen? The reality is, our world right now, as 1 John 5 says, is that it's actually in control of the evil one. Verse 19, it says, For we know from there... From this, we know this is from God. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. That struck me as actually quite a surprise. That's written to a, to a church that John writes to 50, 60 years after Jesus' resurrection. And he's saying there, the world's in control of the evil one. The evil one runs the show down here. 
And that lifts our sights to the reality of the spiritual battle that Easter reminds us of, that there's a battle against death and Jesus has been victorious. Colossians chapter one tells us that those who are in Christ have been pulled from the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of God in whom he loves. Now the reality is of that radical transformation you and I still stink a little bit from our previous kingdom. I used to be a short order cook in, uh, in high school, and I made this dish called beef stroganoff. And I was responsible for uh, pulling all the beef apart. And I didn't wear gloves. I wasn't supposed to. I washed my hands really thoroughly. That might be a, a B plus rating for the restaurant that we had. Maybe that's why. But anyway, I remember having to pull that meat apart and make this uh, beef stroganoff and make hamburgers and all this other kind of stuff. And I would wash my hands so thoroughly. I would just, I feel like I'd scrape four layers off my fingers before I went home. And I'd be at home doing my homework, you know, waving my hand ever so slightly. And I would smell that beef. And I would get so insecure, like, am I just smelling like beef everywhere I go? Daggone it, beef stroganoff. And it would be every day, just my pores soaking in the beef, the raw meat. And I was like, my gosh, my hands, I know it. Even after a thorough shower, I'm back at school the next day and I'm like, no, it's there. And the reality is spiritually, you are regenerated if you're a disciple of Jesus. You are, the old is gone, the new has come, but the stink that's still on us is the consequences of our sin that we committed before we were redeemed. And what that means, I'm not saying you actually stink, but these are the cognitive biases that we have, the way we view the world, the things that we were taught growing up, the, thing, the way we see things still lingers, where the Bible actually has to tell us in James chapter 1 to actually get rid of the filth and excess of your sinful nature. Meaning, yes, we're regenerated. That's not something to be insecure about, but it's a sense of, I still have some things that are like the world, and I need a breakthrough with those. And what that does is that it reminds us that even though we're redeemed, these things still cling to us. A residue remains. The mold in the pot is still there, even though we've been translated from, king, from darkness to the kingdom of God. And why I bring all that up is to lift our eyes collectively that what we're, what we're a part of, what we're in, is the radical need for not just your breakthrough, but everyone to have that type of breakthrough. That transformation from the world to the kingdom is possible. It's there. All of us have these residues that still need to be dealt with. So therefore, we can gain that and achieve that and be reminded of that in Easter. You know, my parents are here, and I thought about them because my mom had these exercise tapes called VHSs, if you remember what those were. And I remember these, um, these tapes being kind of stacked nicely underneath our TV. But then there would be fun shows that would come on for kids, and she used that. She was an aerobics instructor many, many years ago. She could still do it for sure. But anyway, I remember we'd have shows come on TV, and there's no DVRs. There's no, you know, you had to record it on another tape. And I remember like, oh, tape my show, mom. Like, I'm off to soccer practice. Can you tape the Goonies? Can you tape this that's coming on TV? You know, the Ninja Turtles. Or can you tape an entire hour of morning cartoons because we've got a game early, you know? And I remember those VHSs where you could rewrite the entire tape. Like, that aerobics instruction is gone. Like, praise God, it's gone. No more aerobics instructors. You know, you pop it in, you're like, oh, no, wrong tape. But it was cartoons. It was completely rewritten. And that's what Easter provides for us. Not a, okay, there's aerobics, and then there's a black fuzzy line, and then the cartoons. But it's completely gone. And now you get a new show. You get a new show. The 80s did have something going. And bringing it here, you know, for us, now we have these live streams where People don't even like to go to a full commercial. You still want to see the action of the sporting event while the commercial's showing over here. 
and we call those TV timeouts. And what Easter is reminding us is that this is not a TV timeout. Like, just take a pause, reflect a little, and then get back on to your life. This is a VHS recording. This is not a pause to the action and you go back on with your life. This is rewriting, recording over the tapes breakthrough that Jesus wants to give us. And I pray that we take advantage of it because the implications of it are phenomenal. The implications of this spiritual battle that the world is still in evil and that we see that being played out moment after moment to a greater degree is that we as God's people, as his church, if we would just recognize what Easter made us into, I think we'd make a, such a bigger impact in this world. I think we would finally see more breakthroughs in our marriages, more of our children becoming disciples, more of our community seeing the love of Christ. We're not talking about filling seats. We're talking about transformation. We're not talking big crowds. We're talking radical change that impacts generations. We just saw all the best looking people of this church leave 25 minutes ago. Those are our kids. If you argue that, you need a breakthrough of other kinds. But anyway, that generation can feel the impact of today. They don't know it yet. They're looking forward to the shiny things out there that are really easily seen, by the way. They're hidden, but they're not. You know, we got to make it easy. But they're there. That's what they may be focusing on. But the choices you make today will impact them one way or the other. And that is such a glory a, a glory filled moment who deserves an opportunity like that a breakthrough choice like that not us but we get it and we're reminded of that in easter flip over to second corinthians chapter 10 i want to remind us who we are actually i'm sorry <laughs> not not second corinthians 10 that's a great one by the way but over in ephesians chapter 3 getting ahead of myself there. Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. This is who we are because of Easter and what we can embrace moving forward that will really bring not only a breakthrough in our world, but a breakthrough to each and every one of us. It says there, Paul's writing, for, I, for this reason I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men and other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in the Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Easter reminds us that the church is meant to now be the messengers to all realms of God's manifold wisdom. Now, some of you gearheads are out there thinking manifold. Okay, I know what that is. It's actually, in the original language, language it's this word called polypoikilis, which you don't need to remember. But what that means is many colors. Poly, many, poikilis, colors. The church is the many colored wisdom of God. Now think about that. What comes to mind? Many colors? Yeah, that was intentional. That was intentional. Many peoples. You saw the context. Gentiles and Jews. Gentiles receiving the message. That's all nations. The church is meant to tell the world that God's way is right. That to actually have many colored 
wisdom, the manifold wisdom, showcasing it to the world. That when we gather as diverse as we are, this is a reminder that God's wisdom works. This is a reminder to the evil one that roams that God's way is working. To have unity among God's people is a shot across the evil one's bow that says, oh no, it's working. I don't watch UFC, but there's a time where the UFC, some guy gets knocked out and his arms go up this, like this, and then the guy just goes over top of him and hits him a couple times for good measure, and the ref's got to come in and call it off. That's the reality of what we've got going on against the evil one. Jesus knocked him out, and the church is meant to get over top of him and take a couple blows just for good measure, to remind him that he lost. And when we transform our lives because of what Jesus has done, it's another reminder to him that he's lost. When we gather, when we're not like the world, where our cognitive biases influence us to where we we favor others, or we're more concerned about color, or we're more concerned about this or that, when these things inform us more than the gospel message, more than the Easter reality, Satan says, dang, I lost that one. Lost this group. This group is showcasing everything that I hoped wouldn't be seen. And he's more than happy to stir up and work extra hard to keep God's church from showcasing this wisdom. It's not just us collectively as a church, although that's super powerful. But think about your family, your marriage. Your marriage is the image of God, man and woman. It's a small slice of the manifold wisdom of God, many colors. And that is actually supposed to be a beacon of radical emphasis that Easter mattered to this couple. You can call it Easter, but the resurrection matters to this couple. And it's your opportunity to take Easter and what he's done to the whole world to now say, it matters for me. And I get to actually showcase that to the world that it matters. So collectively as a church, Easter matters. The resurrection matters in our lives. But does it matter to you? We'll know, and I'll know if it matters to me, by the breakthroughs I can have because of it. Stubborn sin that's crept up and made its home in our hearts of 2020. Does the resurrection matter? It does. And that sin can be eradicated. Is your marriage stale? Are the husbands leading? If they're not, you can be transformed. You can change. Today is an opportunity for a breakthrough. Are our kids learning about God? Maybe not. But today can be a breakthrough. Is there someone in your family that's just like, man, they need to have a breakthrough spiritually? If the resurrection matters, we'll pray and we'll pursue, and we won't give up till they have that. Is there an issue in your community, a sphere of concern that you say, this has got to change, it's got to change now? Easter provides us with the reminder that a breakthrough can happen. Mary would have told you, and the disciples would have told you on the way out of Emmaus in the upper room, that the idea of their Jesus raising from the dead, even though he told them multiple, multiple times, would be impossible. But he did it. So for you and I, what's impossible? What's impossible? Lift our eyes away from just circumstances and lift our eyes up to the possibilities of breakthrough. In our community, in our church, in your marriage, in your parenting, in your house, at your job, and in your heart. Nothing is impossible. My encouragement for us is to understand that breakthrough is only really inspiring if the previous situation is really junky. If someone's like already awesome and then gets more awesome, you're like, whatever. 
Tom Brady, who cares? Six, seven, what's the difference? But if someone's really terrible and then they're awesome, that's the stuff to write home about. That's the kind of stuff we like to hear. That's the kind of stories that we gobble up. That's the stuff that's inspiring. From great to greater, who cares? There's a book about good to great. That's more inspiring. How about from terrible to great? That's our lives. Mary Magdalene, demon-possessed by seven demons. That's biblical language for completely possessed. She's completely possessed, and now she's the first one to see Jesus resurrected. That's inspiring. From terrible, lost, tortured, to now the, now the vocalist of the resurrection. Peter, betrayed, Jesus, fishing, discouraged, and then he goes on to be the leader of God's church from terrible to great. The resurrection mattered. Those disciples who were cowering in fear are now all going out boldly and all die for Jesus. The resurrection mattered. You're stuck. You're beating your head up against the wall. You're consumed with disillusionment. You're knocked down with discouragement. Your heart's grown stale. Whatever the situation is, good. You're terrible. But God can create a breakthrough to make us great. And that's the beauty of Easter. Lift your eyes to the possibilities. No more waiting down here. Easter says, look up and get ready for breakthrough. Easter says, the church, you are the manifold wisdom of God. Walk proudly. This is not megalomania. This isn't some arrogant, presumptuous statement. You are meant to show the world God's wisdom is right. So when you go after loving and serving, no matter what the circumstances are, when you care about healing and compassion and empathy and sympathy and listening, when you engage in those who are broken, when you love and embrace, it is literally fireworks to the evil one showcasing God's wisdom matters. So make a decision specifically, where do I want to see the resurrection matter to me? Where in my life or my family or my community will the resurrection matter? And watch out for the colored, many colored display of God's wisdom shown right here in Roanoke because of Easter. Easter gives us that opportunity for a breakthrough. Let's take it because Jesus died and rose for it. Amen? Amen. Let's stand for one final song and then we'll go chase down some plastic eggs. Thanks so much for coming. Happy Easter.